here to start five minutes later. So we gave people time to grab lunch. Uh, my name is Mark Grover. I'm one of the organizers of SF Big Analytics, which is a meetup group in the Bay Area. And due to the unprecedented situation with COVID, we are doing virtual meetups. So if it's your first time attending a virtual meetup here with the group, welcome. If it's your uh, latter second time or more, uh, still welcome. And thank you for rejoining us. Uh, today, we have a great set of talks, uh, one from Lyft around operations of Apache Kafka and how do we um, maintain the cost and the efficiency when operating Kafka. And second from Workday around operating uh, in efficiently with uh, operational data and analysis of operational data when it comes to cloud services. So I'm super excited. I wanted to make two announcements before we get started. The first one is that uh, if you're asking questions, please ask them in the Q&A section of the Zoom call, not in the chat section. In the Q&A section, you can also vote for each other's questions, and these questions will be asked by me to the presenters towards the end of the talk. Second is that uh, this call is recorded. Um, so if you don't get a chance to attend or have to leave halfway through, you will find it on YouTube later on as well. So without further ado, I wanted to introduce our first set of speakers. Uh, the topic of the first talk is, can Apache Kafka handle a lift write? And there are two great phenomenal speakers, um, Andre Falco, who is a staff software engineer at Lyft, and John Sason, who is a senior software engineer at Lyft. Both of them work on Kafka and have had uh, experience working on Kafka and Pulsar and things of that nature in their past organizations as well. So please welcome Andre and John. Hey, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, should I begin? Yes. All right. Um, after launching a successful Kafka platform at Lyft, the rides team approached us with the question, can Kafka handle a Lyft ride? On the surface, it seems like an easy question to answer, but in reality, we found that there are nuanced issues that we need to tackle to make this happen at scale. We'll first kind of breeze through the who we are section we just got introduced by Mark. Um, we will then explain how we can architect our rideshare system without having Kafka. Then we will go into an architecture that uses Kafka with a pub sub architecture. Then Jean will tell you about how we need to harden the architecture to have it handle things that um, you know, happen at scale. And we'll have a demo a before and after of our architecture. And then we'll wrap things up with a rundown of things that we haven't explored yet and work that we plan to undertake. Again, I'm just gonna breeze through this section. Mark already introduced us. So let's talk about what makes what it takes to make a ride successful. We hope that most of you are familiar with Lyft, but in case you are not, we provide the ability for people to request rides. You enter your desired destination, press confirm and request, and we match you with a driver who will pick you up and take you to your destination. It's a mobile app, so you you will hit the 4G Wi-Fi network or, or Wi-Fi network, which will then take you to a Lyft web service. And then you can think of your ride getting persisted in some sort of database. Your Lyft app then pulls, you know, again, goes going through 4G Wi-Fi network, hitting a Lyft web service, and then reading from that database to tell you how your ride is doing. No, this isn't our actual architecture. We don't want anyone to fall asleep, so we'll keep things fuzzy and simple. Now, Lyft doesn't have just two web services. It has countless services that exist that Shepard arrive through a fairly massive state machine. If we try, if we try to rely on a single database, a single shared database for this state machine, our system will slow down 
at scale because of this various distributed locking problems. The database also needs to be very available and reliable. Otherwise, all of Lyft will only be as reliable as that central database. When you boil things down, Lyft is in the business of scaling complicated distributed state machines and trying to have them work in near real time. Our state machines are not just these two. There, there are many different use cases that we, we try to factor in. Um, and also the state machines have a lot more states than, than in these examples. A variation of the architecture is to use distributed message queues. And in reality, we kind of have our re real architecture loosely based on, uh, on them. Rather than communicating with other services via a shared database, we have a central queue or multiple queues that allow you to send messages to various target services. Our services also are able to, or our service owners are, are able to maintain their own databases for their services this way. So all the communication cross services happens through the distributed queue. Um, the problem with this architecture, however, as you will see in a little bit, is that it is less efficient because you need to duplicate data in multiple places, whether it's in various databases or in multiple message queues to make sure that they go to various services. So let's see if we can do better with a pub sub architecture. So why do we need to duplicate our messages in with a queuing model? Well, that's because with a queuing system, every time a consumer reads a message, it will pick it off the queue and the message will disappear from that queue. If you want another consumer group to pick off these messages, you need to duplicate these messages in another, in another queue. With PubSub, you don't have that problem because you have an immutable log. This is how Kafka works. You have multiple consumer groups that read the same messages in the same common order. We no longer need to duplicate the, the data in another queue to have another set of consumers consume it. The other thing that you can do with an immutable log is that you can replay messages as long as they don't roll over after a preset expiration period. This allows us to have some context of our state transitions where necessary. And in summary, a queuing system is single subscriber, whereas PubSub is multi-subscriber. Replay, Non-replayable versus replayable. So here's how we can re-architect our systems to run on something that supports PubSub semantics like Kafka. Uh, you will notice that we can have a topic coming from the Lyft web service that has our ride requests. And any services that we want to subscribe to ride requests can pick up that message. An additional thing that we can do is have CDC streams that can, that can absolve us of having databases for services that might not need them. The CDC streams capture database transaction logs to respond to events as they are persisted in the databases. For example, our ETA service might want latest information about traffic and matches to be able to stream ETAs as conditions change based on those two, two databases. And it can do that in near real time. Again, we're trying to stay efficient by reducing duplication of data. You have to pay for your data and you have to pay for your data transfers, at least on AWS. Let's zoom a little bit on, on our Lyft web service, our hypothetical Lyft web service. In the demo that we'll show in a little bit, our web service writes to one topic where it publishes ride requests. The second topic is where state transitions go. If a ride is matched, we find out about it there. We consume from our mutable log in this case and update our fast in-memory key value store Redis so that when a user's mobile app pulls the web service, we respond with the latest known state that we've seen without having to pull Kafka for it. 
There's an additional thing we need to worry about, however. We've identified that it might take upwards of several seconds to have a round trip between our publish and subscribe. Remember, we're trying to build near real-time software here. We, um, while normally it takes about three to 10 milliseconds for produce calls when our cluster is healthy, that's, which is most of the time, sometimes when we have a broker fail, we have spikes at the tail end that are multi-second long. Why does it take multiple seconds? Well, your client's connections to that Kafka broker that failed get severed. And they, then they need to reconnect to leaders that get elected. While leader election process in itself is pretty fast, on the client side, it takes some time for them to recognize where to start producing again. This is why request timeout Kafka setting is set to be a whole minute by default. On Flint producers, we found that we had to set this request timeout to be two minutes. Again, at scale, where brokers have several thousands of partitions and, and, and many clients, there's a lot of chaos that goes on anytime a broker fails. And broker failures should be the norm because we might have routine restarts and reboots, as we'll discuss in a little bit. So let me show you a demo of, uh, of a simulator of, that, that generates rides. You can see that our, at peak, sometimes our latency spiked to about 227 milliseconds. At P9999, that's four nines. So that's, that's very tail. And normally our kind of P99s are under about 30 milliseconds. We have five hosts in this uh, test cluster and we track their uptime in hours. And then we track the messages coming in and out. So what we'll do is we'll reboot that, the whole Kafka cluster. We have automation that will reboot one broker at a time, which takes about 10 minutes because it makes sure that the brokers come up, that all the leader elections complete, that all of the partitions get synchronized. And I'm gonna be speeding this demo up so that no one needs to, needs to no, gets tempted to snooze. Uh, so here's one broker that, that goes down. Our stats are aggregated every minute, so they're a little delayed. So that's why you see the node uptime being a little offset from our latency. So you can see the first broker got rebooted and we already have close to half a second of latency. You're, if you happen to have a request running on your Lyft app, you're gonna start seeing a little bit, of, a little bit of lag here. Remember, there's that Wi-Fi 4G network that we have to deal with in addition to all of our transfers through the Kafka system. We have a second broker getting rebooted, so now our tail latency is close to two, well, it is two seconds now. So in this demo, we, are, we have two hops going on, just like, you know, sorry, so sorry, four hops going on. First, we hop to one Kafka topic, then we go to a, a simulated ride masher service, then that writes to our state transition topic, and then we read, read that back and compute the end-to-end -end latency. So essentially, this is a simulation of a Lyft app polling without the 4G network. So you see that now there's a second, um, second peak that's a little better, about 1.6 seconds. We've now rebooted three brokers. We now have another peak at about 2.6 seconds. This cluster is, you know, a, a very kind of, um, um, it's a kind of a clean, clean uh, like a clean dust environment. I forget what the, the term actually is, but if you have a cluster at scale, we find that these peaks top out at about three and a half seconds. 
So this cluster is actually very, a very healthy cluster. That's why we, we're not getting to that three and a half second in this, in this example. So kind of five brokers have now rebooted. You can see that there's been like four, four or five peaks that exceeded 225 milliseconds. Um, so there's at scale, there's, there's some subset of users that got, a, got impacted by our routine rolling reboot that we you know, do at least monthly. So what can we do about, about it? How can we make this better? I would like to now hand off to Jean, who will tell you how we overcame this problem, pro we, how we can overcome this problem, as well as other problems that we identify. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Andre. Uh, so now we know that the PopSup architecture is better suited for our needs. Uh, I'd like to give more background on what we need to do uh, to support our uh, critical internal customers with a platform that's reliable and robust uh, and also has low barrier to entry and uh, low cost to maintain in the long term for everyone, including the platform team and the uh, clients. Uh, so basically, er, the demo Andre showed was in uh, Java. We use Java clients, uh, but in our company, we have uh, clients with uh, using various uh, programming languages, anything from uh, GoLang uh, to C Sharp uh, to Ruby. Uh, so what we do uh, to onboard them to our platform is uh, we hand out a recommended set of uh, configuration knobs for Kafka. Uh, that we would like them to follow, uh, as well as some code to uh, basically pull in the credentials so that they can authenticate and authorize. Uh, also, uh, we give them a, a Python uh, wrapper that is uh, for metrics so that we can uh, look at their client site metrics. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, we realized that there are some, uh, these things just don't go as smoothly as we hope to. And uh, basically, the multi-programming language support, uh, support uh, becomes a problem. Uh, basically, not everyone has uh, follows the same metrics. Uh, they don't necessarily uh, use the Python wrapper. Uh, so uh, it's not very trivial for us to measure the client experience uh, with that setup. Uh, for example, is it, uh, as a part of post-mortem recently, our team was investigating the impact uh, of the incident on latencies experienced by clients, and we were hoping just to put some wildcards in a dashboard and see all the metrics, but this didn't turn out to be so easy because of this problem. So uh, having a proxy service could abstract all this complexity away from the clients, and we could programmatically enforce uh, the uh, configuration knobs as well as the metrics namespace and the metric names that we want the, cl the clients to use. Uh, on top of the client ecosystem, well, as Andre mentioned, uh, we have, uh, we perform some operations on the cluster, so our team is responsible for that. And uh, one of them is security updates, as we talked about, which requires reboot. Uh, we host uh, potential PII data on our cluster, so we cannot compromise here. Uh, also, as part of life, we have network failures, uh, host failures, and operator errors uh, that may uh, introduce uh, problems uh, to the clusters. So we need to handle these gracefully, uh, and we want to shield our clients from these. Also, we upgrade uh, the Kafka version that we run. We, we strive to run the uh, most up-to-date stable version in our clusters. Uh, as well as our platform is, is responsible for disaster recovery. Uh, so when you think about uh, our platform as a infrastructure for uh, the critical parts of our business, uh, even though Kafka is a platform that's replicated and redundant on its own, uh, we just cannot rely on only one cluster to serve these critical customers in case the cluster goes down. We don't want the business to go down. So uh, in the demo you just uh, saw, uh, there, here, here is the setup. We have a Kafka cluster. 
and we have some simulated components such as the ride generator that uh, generates the rides and writes to a uh, ride uh, request topic. And we have a ride matcher which uh, simulates a, all that state machine, a bunch of components that uh, reports the, uh, that matches the rides to uh, drivers and then reports back the right state changes to a separate topic, which is consumed by a right consumer. Uh, and uh, that notifies the interested parties. Uh, so uh, as a change, what we propose is to keep a lid on our latencies, the tail end latencies is uh, to introduce a proxy uh, that can route between multiple Kafka clusters. In this, uh, in the, uh, I'm going to show a demo soon and in that we have a gRPC based proxy and uh, for producers only. Uh, we don't necessarily need it for consumers uh, as a starting point because uh, they can consume from both clusters uh, at the same time. Even though uh, we could uh, use the proxy, uh, as I mentioned, to solve other problems uh, in, uh, to improve uh, the platform uh, so that we can programmatically enforce configuration and at the same time uh, have uh, metrics so consumers could take advantage of that but for now it's only for writers and in order to determine uh, if our proxy needs to switch the traffic to one cluster from the other uh, we implemented a, a zookeeper based uh, coordination system uh, where we uh, basically host the endpoints in the zookeeper and the proxy listens to that. Uh, so obviously here the uh, proxy will add another uh, hop and uh, we observe this uh, at medium latencies anywhere from uh, two milliseconds to five milliseconds uh, additional latency. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we put a lid on top of our uh, tail and latency. So when we uh, restart one cluster, uh, the other one takes the traffic transparently and uh, we don't see those latencies that we, we uh, observed in the first demo. Uh, so now it's demo time. I'll show you uh, how this all works in a, uh, an experiment. So uh, we are looking at a very similar dashboard. Uh, we have the round trip latency, uh, we have the rise generated and matched metric. Uh, but on the bottom, you'll notice there are two clusters now. There's one cluster which is taking the traffic currently, and then there is another cluster down that, and then we also can observe the node uptimes, which will indicate that there has been a restart. And uh, this demo is also a sped up demo. So you move the mouse moving very quickly. That's not me. <laughs> uh, so that we can actually, uh, this process takes time and we can uh, observe the metrics uh, much faster. So I'm going to now uh, go ahead and uh, fail over and uh, restart the clust uh, cluster, uh, kick off a restart simultaneously. And once this is done, uh, we will uh, observe a few things. First of all, we'll see that the uh, cluster one uh, traffic is uh, moving away from uh, cluster one to cluster two and uh, simultaneously the nodes are restarting on cluster one and we will get the chance to observe the latencies and uh, see that they're uh, better compared to the first approach uh, as well as we'll uh, keep an eye on our rights generated and matched so that uh, we don't actually lose data. Uh, so, as you can see, the restart uh, and the uh, failover is already happening. Uh, cluster one uh, has uh, reduced the uh, traffic now uh, to almost zero and the uh, cluster two is picking up traffic. And we can take a look at the uh, latencies. They're actually nowhere uh, near uh, second. Uh, we are around uh, at most like 300 milliseconds and pin 99.99, uh, but the latencies are kept well below uh, the original, uh, origin com compared to the original setup. And as you can see, the nodes are uh, starting up uh, rebooting one by one, uh, but uh, that's fine because actually we don't have any traffic on cross to one right now. And um, yeah, the, as you can see, the latencies are uh, below, uh, below one second still, uh, nothing going on there. Uh, there are some spikes of 300 milliseconds, but 
that's well below the original one. And you may observe the rights generated and matched is actually uh, more in uh, right now. Uh, that's actually because a uh, cluster two can, it seems that cluster two can uh, do more. And in our simulation, we just have a sleep in between some requests and uh, it's just that that cluster can do more. Let's see. So what lies ahead uh, in the future for us? Uh, what can we explore and experiment with uh, given this uh, result? So uh, we would like to take a look at uh, uh, a different setup like this uh, and explore it. Uh, it's a cluster per availability zone. Uh, so we are planning to, with this, we are planning to save money on cross AC transfer. And uh, given now that we have a proxy that can route between uh, clusters, uh, we can have uh, smaller clusters, uh, but more number of clusters. And so we are hoping that we can uh, utilize them more and we don't have any clusters idling at uh, any time. And we, with this, we also uh, will likely have lower uh, median latencies uh, because there is no cross AZ transfer. Uh, the other thing we are, are planning to look at is a, having a uh, fast cluster switch. So the uh, coordination uh, I uh, talked about in the previous, uh, in, in the demo I showed, uh, is based on a uh, zookeeper, but it doesn't take advantage of what Kafka already uh, keeps uh, in uh, its zookeeper metadata, uh, which is the Z nodes that tell about the health of a broker. So if you could uh, also make use of that, uh, uh, that would also handle the uh, uh, lead relations and uh, we could uh, have a, a more a unified approach between Kafka and our proxy. Uh, and also, uh, there is a blog post that Andre wrote a while back, uh, which is about a component that we have in-house, which is called Kafka Remediator. Uh, we use this for uh, our operations. Uh, we use it for uh, basically uh, handling host level failures or network failures. If you're interested, take a look at the uh, blog post. But uh, we also would like to leverage that. so that it simplifies our system and we have one thing there. Uh, we, we use uh, one component to handle the operations. So that's another option. So uh, another future uh, possibility is uh, maybe some of you have heard about Envoy. Uh, for those who haven't, uh, it's an L4, L7 proxy that was born in Lyft. Now it's open sourced and uh, it's actually widely used in industry. Uh, as a proxy or a sidecar proxy, we use it heavily in Lyft as a service to uh, service uh, in service to service communication. So out of the box, and what it gives us a framework for observability and metrics, uh, fault injection, and a way to implement health checks as well as service discovery. So uh, with this, uh, if, if you use Envoy, that would basically uh, again simplify our architecture in the sense that we would be using the same infra as the rest of the lift. So we are uh, looking into this as well. There is already a filter that's uh, implemented uh, for Kafka protocol. And uh, lastly, the uh, a uh, topic discovery system. So we already have in-house a component called Kafka Topic Provisioner, uh, which uh, is basically responsible for bookkeeping all the topics you have in-house, all the users and their corresponding quotas. Uh, so what we really want is we want to uh, turn this into a, a first class service uh, that uh, the proxy can use or uh, any non-proxy clients can use uh, as a discovery system. And now I'd like to hand off the virtual mic uh, back to Andre for the conclusion. Thank you, Jean. Let me re-share my screen. Okay, I think that worked. Oh. Um, yeah, so if, if uh, you've Hopefully not taking a snooze, but if you have, um, this is the slide to take away from our presentation. Uh, first, uh, if you are building a system that needs to process complicated state machines, 
in near real time. A distributed logging system such as Kafka is a good thing to potentially use. Second, if you want to tame your P99 latencies for whatever, whatever use case, uh, you can do that at the expense of slightly Did we lose Andre? I think he's coming back. Andre, you are muted. You're muted. Oh, can everyone hear me? Sorry about that. My browser tab uh, reset. Hands were off the off the keyboard. Um, anyway, I was saying um, you can tame your P99 latencies at the expense of slightly higher P50 latencies. Uh, we demonstrated that with our proxy. And and third, if you're going to go with a multi-cluster solution, make sure that you have a requisite set of infrastructure to go along with it. For example, a topic discovery and provisioning system, a remediator perhaps that can pick up uh, failures from, uh, from Zookeeper and things like that. Um, yeah, so thank you all for tuning into our presentation. We hope that we've been able to teach you a little bit about our experience and more than happy to talk with anyone about potentially better ways of solving the problems that we're up against. Feel free to reach out to us on GitHub, email, or LinkedIn. And if you'd like to view the demos or go through our presentation at your own pace, there's a link down below. Thank you all very much. Cool. Thank you, Andre and John. Uh, we've got a lot of questions. Uh, the most voted up question is from Sapta, who is asking, new architecture of Kafka is evolving to remove the Zookeeper dependency. Will that impact your architecture of Zookeeper to gRPC proxy? If yes, how do you plan to resolve it? Uh, I, I can probably answer that one. Um, so, one, so, so even though Kafka is going to move to Zookeeper, if you read their KIP, they're going to have a kind of API-driven way to inter do interaction with their uh, leader election system that they're going to build into Kafka. Uh, so, I, I mean, we'll have to make adjustments and probably reuse that system to add our own metadata there. You can potentially use a, a, a Kafka topic in itself to, to handle it as well. Uh, but it'll definitely add some additional work down the line if we proceed with our, with our architecture. Cool. The next voted question is from Aniket, who's who's got a series of questions and I'll ask one at a time. The first question is, uh, I might have missed this, but are you using AWS or on-premise Kafka cluster for your clusters? Uh, so we are using uh, in-house managed, but uh, AWS hosted uh, Kafka clusters. So we are using EC2, but we are building our own clusters. Got it. Next question from Aniket is, how do you deal with Kafka schema changes? Are you using Confluence schema registry? Uh, that's another thing that we didn't have time to go into. Uh, we are not doing uh, schema management at the moment, uh, but that's something that we, we kind of have internal plans to build into our topic provisioning and discovery system. Cool. The last question is, in the previous meetup at Lyft, um, I think you guys were experimenting using Apache Beam as a wrapper around Kafka streaming slash Flink. Are you still actively using that in production? Uh, the answer is yes. I wasn't, I don't have the full context because I wasn't in that meetup, but yes, the answer is yes. Cool. The next question is from Ekin, who is asking, why did you choose gRPC? Um, and you know, it wasn't, it, it's kind of ar arbitrary, our choice of, of, of gRPC, it could be it could be REST. Uh, it was just we wanted to, to kind of build a demo, pro, you know, kind of proof of concept. I mean, we just kind of right off the bat decided to do it gRPC. Um, I mean, I think it'll be worthwhile to also have it support um, REST. 
uh, or maybe even reuse Confluence uh, proxy and, and have it do the same thing under uh, behind the scenes. But no, no like interesting reason why. Cool. The next question is from Tarun, who's asking, would you suggest Kinesis by AWS over Kafka in terms of management? Suppose we have 10 billion record requests in one day. So I guess this can lead to a more of a philosophical discussion. But uh, what I would like to say is we use both in Lyft. And each platform has the, its own strengths. And there are certain use cases that we uh, would like to use Kafka uh, for because of its strengths. And but we are using both at Lyft, and we have we are running uh, I guess at that scale. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add to that. Um, you you uh, with, with Kinesis, you're you're kind of paying for shards, whereas with Kafka, you're paying for network. So if you have use cases where you need to control the number of you know parallelism with partitions or anything like that then kafka might be something more natural to use and more efficient whereas kinesis you're you're going to be bound to having to scale your shards up and down but like jean said there's pros and cons with with both systems thanks andre the last question for the day uh, for you too is uh, from vikram how is the data sync between the different clusters Um, so it's it's not um, we we only write to one cluster or the other um, and have two consumer or have consumers uh, pulling from both clusters at the same time in separate threads. So uh, just to add to that, what would be interesting uh, to uh, explore in the long term? I guess there are two things. One is of course use a mirror maker or a similar so uh, service to replicate. And we are also looking into uh, offset management uh, from uh, different clusters. Also, on top of that, there's a kit right now for uh, tiered storage. Uh, I'm sure people uh, are following that. So uh, once that's uh, in its final stages, we would like to potentially look into merging the data in the remote on the uh, tier outside the uh, broker hosts. Awesome. Well, thank you again, both uh, Jean and Andre for a great talk. Uh, we really appreciate your help. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Next up is from uh, Workday. And uh, Lee is going to talk to us about how Workday uh, and his team have optimized uh, cloud services through analyzing operational data on the big data platform. Uh, Lee is a senior machine learning engineer at Workday and is leading a team uh, which is building the data science analytical platform at Workday. So please welcome Lei. Hey, thanks, Mark. And thanks to everyone for attending my presentation. Let me share my screen at first. Uh, so can you see it? Yes. OK, awesome. So OK. Uh, Today, I will talk about uh, how to optimize the uh, cloud service and uh, through analyzing the big data. And uh, for my presentation, I will focus on uh, two things. And uh, uh, one thing is that uh, I, I believe that um, maybe some people will be curious how the, what the operational daily work or what the operational problem we try to resolve uh, in the cloud uh, company. And I will give some, share some insight or uh, experience and what problem we are trying to resolve. And another thing that I, I want to highlight uh, one of the, our in-house tool and building a self-service uh, data pipeline engine and show how, how we build it and what, what the motivation behind it. And OK, I need to introduce myself again, but really quick. And uh, I'm a senior machine learning engineer at Workday. And now it's leading a team to build a data science analytics platform. And it's an internal uh, data, science, data uh, tool, and we provide it uh, to the data scientists, the data analysts, or PMs, and for their self-service. And before working on this one, and uh, my job is really the data scientist, and uh, I'm uh, responsible for tuning the model of some data analysis work. OK, here is today's agenda. And firstly, I will talk about uh, what the problem we are trying to resolve. And how the cloud service and look like. And afterwards, I will talk about 
the platform, Goku platform, and uh, it's our in-house platform, and we call it Goku. And uh, later, I will talk about the, our in-house data pipeline tool and the focus on the motivation and, uh, and the, the technology we use to build it. Okay, firstly, uh, Workday, and the Workday is a leading provider of enterprise cloud application for finance, HR, and planning. And if you apply for a job, or you got the payment every month, and definitely you may use our technology. And we are based on the cloud, so we have a lot of cloud customers, and from the small customer to the large customers. So this is the reason we have a different problem with what, for, our, for our operation. And we collect a lot of operational data, and we use this data to improve our customer satisfaction and also improve our uh, operational efficiency. I, I use one of the problems and we, we try to resolve and as one example. And here is a very typical uh, water bucket problem. And uh, we have, uh, in, at Workday, we have uh, different server types. We have a really powerful server and we also have some average uh, servers. And also on another side, on the customer side, we also have like the, uh, some customer, like a hundred of thousand employee, uh, global uh, companies. And we also have some small customer and relatively small customer, like a thousand of employees. And uh, so how we can uh, allocate the results and for different side of different customers and make sure firstly, and we can guarantee their SLA, make sure they have the good uh, user experience. On another side, we want to reduce or improve our operational efficiency and how make these two things happen work together. And this is a very typical optimization problems. And besides it, and there are also a lot of other um, problems we need to fix and on the, on the daily. And for example, the anomaly detection or some prediction. But today, I will focus on and look at this single problem and see how we resolve it. And if you have done any uh, data analysis work, you will see uh, then usually it will fall fit into the similar pattern and how to resolve a pro a, a operational problem or even data problem. And the first one is that you need to leverage some descriptive analytics. For example, if we want to understand that for one customer and that they use a lot of results and we want to understand what happened, how much results actually 90% or 80% that they use it average. And also we want to understand the uh, 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 whether they are under the uh, SLA or they have uh, very close to the SLA. And, uh, and, uh, but uh, go find the problem or describe what happened for a customer and uh, it's not a goal. We want also the next step will do some diagnostic analysis. It's really like, okay, uh, if we have this uh, node problem and we want to understand what caused the problem, what the root cause. And the next, in the next level is that we want to do some prediction and just in case we can prepare very well and if we are have a new customer or some customer uh, going to a peak season. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there are so many different uh, persona at Workday or user groups and we have the PM group, we have the data scientist, the data analyst, um, engineer. So we try to provide a self-service uh, tool and for each uh, and for each groups, and uh, under this self-service analytics tool side, and we want to try to meet uh, four different uh, dimensions. And the first one is the data discovery, and the people can very easy to find the data side they are interested. And go to next level when, when they find the data, and we want to provide some tool like the notebook or the SQL lab, and so they can do the data exploration by themselves, and they can slice and dice the data. But uh, people always love a chart and or, or, or dashboards, so we provide some tool, and so people can build a chart or dashboards and uh, realize the data. And finally, it's very interesting that uh, we have a lot of domain experts and uh, they, are, uh, they are very familiar with each service and how they can share their, their data to other groups. So people can leverage the, the existing the knowledge about data. So we, have, we also need to provide some tool. They can do the data, sharing the data uh, 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 by themselves. But in, uh, on the center is that uh, if you look at the, this life cycle and we try to automate it, this is a reason we, we build this tool uh, is the data pipeline. And if you look at the data world and it's totally automate your data life cycle and, uh, and make sure it can be reused and shared. 
So uh, before going forward to talk about uh, the, the tool or the platform we are using, and I share some number about our data site. And uh, uh, since now we have a 19 terabytes of data and uh, in the HDFS clusters. And uh, uh, each month we have a uh, two trillion message uh, from Kafka ingested into our HDFS. And we have over 740 tables. You can think about each table represents one service. You can think about how complex uh, the, the workday uh, system or architecture. Uh, yeah, here is the uh, Google platform and to, to, to provide uh, the self-service analytics tool. And we are on, in the middle of this uh, tech stack. And on the bottom is the uh, storage and computing. You can think about this HDFS, S3 bucket, or any Spark, this kind of uh, storage or computing uh, framework. But on top of it, we provide a bunch of uh, tool sites and integrate them together so people can do the self service. And for example, uh, we provide a data discovery tool and build on top of Amazon, and we really like it. And also, we provide a notebook service and using the data exploration. And for the analytics, we have the SuperSight and we have the R Studio or R Shiny and H2O for the machine learning. And also we leverage the Spark Delta Data Lake and integrate with the, our in-house in uh, 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 tool, Goku Flow, so can provide the automation and also the time travel functionalities. On top of it, it's really our user group and they can do some ad hoc queries, they can build dashboard and reporting, and they even can build some data application and data sharing. And here is another uh, perspective or view to look at the, the Goku platform. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, on the, on the first level, it's really provide the, uh, the discovery. And on top of it, we have the realization, H2O, SuperSight, and Arshani. And also, we have the SQL Lab and the Zeppelin. I think I want to highlight this part, because if you want to build a chart or dashboard, or you want to build an ML model, and uh, the final goal is that you want to uh, repeat it, you want to automate it, right? And so this is the reason we are building this data pipeline engine, just to totally automate all the stuff. It's not only about data, actually automate all the workflow. For example, uh, when you your data and find some anomalies, and our user want to automatically send alert to the Slack, or even automatically create a Jira or Confluence page and update it. All these things, the automation, we have done a lot of integration uh, uh, with our uh, in-house tool, our internal tools, make sure the fully workflow can be automated. And uh, here is the Goku store, and uh, this is where we are working on the Delta Data Lake. It's really built some uh, uh, data sharing or uh, oh, 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 Delta functionality on top of the Goku flow. Okay, and because, I, I mentioned this several times, so repeat it, okay. Um, we want to look at the, the, the Goku flow and it's our in-house tool. And so this is the reason I will spend more time on the uh, Goku flow part. Uh, yeah, and before uh, working on the Goku flow and uh, we do a bunch of evaluation and recently I just uh, you know revisited the evaluation again and then look at more options in the market. And we have the Apache Woody, it's really early, uh, uh, a data pipeline engine and definitely Airflow is really popular and also Uber has a Piper and their in-house tool. I look at that and we have the view. Maybe it's not a perfect uh, uh, feed for the for the for the flow uh, uh, data pipeline, but it can provide some similar functionalities. And there are also some commercial tool uh, in the market. But the challenge for us to look at the commercial tool is that we cannot. Uh, customize it and we cannot integrate with our uh, in-house or our internal tools. That's really a big challenge. Okay, and uh, also uh, we when we develop the, the flow and we, we list all the requirements we want to achieve and uh, I will not go to all the details, but I'll just highlight several things. And the first one is that we want to provide a self-service uh, workflow or pipeline engine. And either the people can programmatically code and build a data pipeline, or they can use the drag and drop uh, using the UI, can build this type of data pipeline. And another requirement that's very important is the high availability. Because this data pipeline or engine 
can need to run continuously, like uh, over uh, weeks or months. So high availability and scalability definitely is uh, uh, one of the major concerns and uh, requirements we need to achieve, we want to achieve. And the next one is that we want to integrate with the Workday uh, technology. And even we use some Jira or Confluence, this is a very typical tool, but uh, it's our operation uh, operating in our, in our, in our uh, data center. So we want to integrate with all this tool, make sure and we can uh, fully automate the workflow or the life cycle. And the multiple uh, language supporting. And also like uh, another one is that very important that we learned we want to support the best uh, software, software engineer practice. And for example, a lot of engineers, they want leverage Git or Ripple or using the CI-CD pipeline. Even they build the, 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 the data pipeline or they build the, the data flow, they want to follow the similar pattern. So it's very important that we support all this functionality and in this flow engine. Uh, yeah, and here I hi highlight what the uh, Goku Flow architecture, and if uh, you are interested, definitely we can discuss more details after this meetup. And we built our Goku Flow on top of the Mesos, and it's a, a distributed engine, and uh, we can allocate the results for each step, uh, for each Goku uh, step or data processing step. And uh, and for each step, it can connect it uh, or integration with different uh, data processing, like the uh, or, or data source, like Hadoop and Hive, Spark, Flink. But on top of it, we build a Goku Flow engine and on top of the Mesos. And it has the Flow Builder and you can build a data pipeline. And it has the scheduler and the runner. And I will have a live demo show how it looks like. Okay, and, but before going to the demo, I want to highlight several things we developed. And the first one is that we are uh, developing a, a DSL language dedicated to build a data pipeline. And if you look at the, on the left, this is really simple uh, use case and you can build a hype step for the query and then you can use Scala to do some further processing. And uh, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We are not uh, using some uh, programming language like the Python or, or Scala. One of the reasons is that we believe that we want to separate this uh, uh, flow building uh, uh, code with the real code. And another thing that we want to make sure we can build a UI on top of this one. So it's pretty very important thing that we have our own DSL language to describe the flow. And this uh, DSL language not only support uh, the sequential and it can also support the, the fork and the join. In other words, it can support a really complex data pipeline and using the, the DSL language. And uh, here is another one is that uh, we build a bunch of library for different language. It's not only for Python, but for R, and it supports multiple language. For each language, we have a library. And uh, one of the reasons we want to build the Goku contact this library for each language is that we want to hide all the details for the data I.O. and the infrastructure. If you look at this one example from the Python, you will see this one want to read the data from the previous step. And if you want to hide the detail, where the data and how the HDFS, whether it's HDFS or S3 bucket. And if you want to hide this detail from the user, and the user only want to know to just call one line of code, a ctx.read, and the data can be automatically read from the previous step and to the next step. So people don't need to care about the infrastructure details and the location. And afterward, if you want to push the data to the next step, for the further processing. For example, this is Python. I want to push to the uh, Spark or Scala uh, for another uh, step. And you can just call another line of code. So it will push the data frame and uh, to the next step for the further process. And the last one is our integration. And we have a lot of integration. For one of the example is that we use the write report. It's really like a, if you build a dashboard and uh, you want to push the final results and to the MySQL or to some other uh, uh, SQL database and for the building the uh, reporting. And you just don't need how to the data ingested or transformed to the MySQL database. You just call one line of code and the data will be pushed to the final realization uh, engine. So this, I, I just highlight several this thing. I just want to make sure uh, you understand why we built this uh, uh, customized library and when we uh, open this one to the users we got a lot of good feedback because they don't need to care about the 
the infrastructure and the details anymore. Even we want to move from our data center HDFS and uh, to the uh, like the uh, to the cloud service or cloud vendor, and we don't need people change their code, and we just want it, we just need to change our 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 library or API, and everything can be done. Okay, uh, the, another one I want to highlight is uh, Delta Data Lake. And I believe that uh, some of Fox and Maisie have uh, joined uh, this year or last year's uh, Spark Summit. And the Delta Data Lake has been uh, talked or discussed a lot. And so this reason we believe that it's very important that we can leverage and the Delta Data Lake. And one of several functionality we are in a uh, high level is that the first thing that uh, before, uh, in the Goku flow and the intermediate data and uh, for the big data volume, like 100 gigabytes of data, we are open some functionality and uh, to the HDFS functionality to the users. So they can manage the data, but HDFS is not ideal for manage big data. And uh, so this reason we want to replace it and uh, abstract it and or provide some API and based on the data data lake. So people can very easily uh, to appending, updating, or overwriting the data. And another functionality we want to provide uh, is the auditing capabilities. Because for each Goku flow, we have the metadata to track uh, the flow details and uh, the, the, the information, running information. But we want to combine the flow metadata and with the data metadata. So every time, uh, for example, the people want to track back or audit the bag one month ago, what the, the flow look like and what the data input, what the data output and uh, how the flow running. And now they can leverage uh, the single interface. They can track back very easily. So this is we leverage the data lake. Definitely there are more functionality like the uh, version or reporting this functionality, we will open it to the users. Okay, uh, yeah, this is the demo. Uh, I want, uh, this demo is just one of, I think the simplest uh, uh, use case and for the Goku flow, how the workday internally using the Goku flow. The use case is really like, okay, uh, for some PM or for some uh, uh, engineer and they build a chart or dashboard and but it's including some metrics. They want to revisit this metrics or this dashboard every week or every month and how they can leverage Goku Flow and to automate how the day life cycle, they don't need to manage it uh, uh, by themselves anymore. And I will show how it works. And firstly, this is the Goku Flow. On the high level of the concept is the project. And you can have your personal project. Definitely you can also create the team projects. And here shows actually you can switch project between uh, the, actually the workspace and uh, you can create a project, uh, yeah, very typical use case. And now I created a, a, a demo for outside of Workday. And uh, if we go to your workspace, and there, the second component or concept is the, uh, the, the code builder. And it's really like an online uh, uh, coding uh, 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 tool. And you can, oh, sorry. Okay, and here is, you can really uh, create a different uh, scripts and uh, or you create the folders and manage your uh, project or code. And for example here, and you can create a Python and it also can provide a multiple language. And uh, for example, I created a simple uh, data pipeline. The first step is using the Spark or the Hive to query the data. And the second step is very simple. I push the data to the uh, Nimbus or the realization engine and create the chart or dashboards. This logic is pretty straightforward and simple. You will see the code is very easy. And it just is a line of several lines of code. You can grab the data and push it to the final destination for the realization part. And on the on the on the flow builder, and we have we can people can create the DSL. Definitely using programmatically create a flow, but also we provide a UI based on the flow engine. So you can use drag and drop to create a, a flow. So I think this has been used dramatically uh, because it's pretty uh, simple. And for example, I, can, I want to leverage the code I just uh, demo. And here you can pick up the running engine. And uh, uh, I pick up the Spark SQL as a running engine. And then I pick up the, the scripts. I just use it and here and to create it. 
And afterwards, I want to create a Python and for further analysis. And I can pick up the running engine and also get, get the step. And you can use this, this connector and directly connect this one. As I mentioned, it also provides or support both and the, the fork and the join. You can create a very complex data pipeline. And also, a uh, very important thing that uh, you can set up a lot of uh, variables. For example, you can create a template and you can put a, a type of different parameter for the, your step. And also, it also provides the, the whole flow. You can provide a lot of environment variables and for the flow to run. And because we are using the missiles and we have the advanced setting is that people can allocate the results and for their step. Okay, cool. And afterwards, yeah, save it. And when you got this flow, uh, everything is done. Uh, you can change the, the, the flow uh, later. And also, very important thing that you can schedule it, right? See here, and we provide a scheduler and the people definitely can schedule to run weekly and or monthly or even hourly. And also, uh, yeah, when the flow is starting and you will see the, the flow will be triggered immediately when the, the cluster have the results. And another very, very important or interesting feature that people can debug or run and monitor it uh, on, on live. And you can see how the flow running and uh, and even there's uh, any errors, you can debug and find what the problem it is. And by the way, uh, I forgot to mention in the code builder and people can also leverage Git repo to manage it. Yeah, here you will see the flow running successfully. And uh, you can also look at the historical uh, flows if we're running multiple times every day or every hour. Okay, and uh, look at here, when you get the data ingested to the, uh, to the, to the Nimbus for the realization, and you will, people will get a notification from the email. So this is very important uh, We integrate multiple service and at work day. So you will see get the email, what the table look like, and it has been ingested successfully, but definitely if you, your flow failed, and you, you will also get this notification. And for the Nimbus, we call the Nimbus, but it's super site and in the community is really, uh, I will not talk too much. It's a very typical use case. And, uh, but the people can directly, the table has been registered uh, automatically. People can pick up the aggre aggregation data from the Nimbus directly and uh, create a chart or dashboards here. And this one is, uh, I use some uh, very public data site. And I think that every people know that it. it's really like the iris and uh, using it for the machine learning. It's very typical data site. Uh, this one uh, is very simple. I just get the average uh, value for each uh, matrix. Okay. And when you run it and you get this one. And, but a very important thing uh, for, our, uh, for our internally, a lot of PM love this feature is that uh, when they save the chart and the dashboard and uh, they don't need to look at uh, the, the manage the pipeline anymore. And because they just schedule the, 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 the flow running hourly or weekly and the dashboard, all this dashboard and the report and even some machine learning models can be automatically refreshed and using the Goku flow. So this, uh, the functionality we really like it or highlight is that uh, we are, I want to, uh, Go back to this one, just highlight again. Uh, yeah, and uh, we just used the Goku flow, build this one, and integrate a different tools. And you will see we have the super side, we have the Amazon, we have used R Studio, R Shiny, we have H2O, o, a lot of open source tools. But very important thing that we are using the Goku flow really more to put them together. And you can automate any data pipeline across different tools. You don't need to worry uh, how I can move the data and how can I trigger one component even they are not a totally different open source tool. So Google Flow play a center or centralized uh, integration engine and a data pipeline engine. So every, the people can totally automate the, the workflow and using the, this in-house tool. And uh, let me see what we have after demo. Yeah, 
Okay, that's all the things I have. And uh, uh, if you are interested on the Goku flow, definitely you can approach to me from LinkedIn. And also, uh, we are uh, thinking about potentially if we got some good feedback of other companies and one also has this kind of a similar tool site and we are we will consider uh, uh, how we can uh, open source it and uh, and so more company or more teams uh, can benefit and from what we have that yeah that's all the uh, slides i have today and uh, uh, any questions yeah, thank you, Leigh. Appreciate your time here and sharing with us. Uh, the first voted question we have is from Sapta. Uh, the first question is, any reasons for not considering Kubeflow cube in your comparison? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Kubeflow actually is recently emerged and, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the industry, and we look at it, and definitely it's one of the, the, the options we will consider it, even we consider move our uh, Missiles and uh, to the Kubernetes and for the better uh, uh, resource management. Yeah, definitely that's one. Also, we need, we will consider it. Got it. And the second question from Sata is, how do you handle model and data versioning? Okay, it's a good question. For the data, uh, so this reason we we are we are integrating with the data data lake and the data lake is really we found is really good and to manage the data versioning and also we use Goku Flow and to integrate with the data data lake metadata. So you have the full life cycle of the metadata to track the data versioning or data uh, data tra data travel. And for the model versioning, and uh, we are we haven't done it, but we are considering using the ML flow. And so you can think about uh, you have the 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 Google flow for the flow running uh, metadata, you have the uh, data data lake for the data uh, metadata, and you have the ML flow for the model versioning. And you have the full uh, you, you you if you merge them together, you have the full uh, picture or view of the uh, data or model uh, versioning. Got it. Thanks, Lei. Next question is from Tarun. How do you manage the resource allocation? How many people can make the cluster run at full utilization? Uh, I think uh, I think it's a good question, and uh, we are. This is the reason we are using the missiles and for the resource utilization. And uh, and since now we because if you look at the Goku flow, and we even apply it for some patterns and patients. And the problem is that uh, if you look at the Goku flow and it has really like an agent and it's not a fully uh, operated for the data processing. For example, if you're running on the Python stack, definitely you can use Goku flow. And but if you are using for the Spark and definitely we have a Spark cluster, but we are using the, the Goku flow is really like an agent and talk with the Spark and, and manage the data IO. And so actually we haven't seen a big challenge for the resource management. And currently we only have six uh, machines and uh, workers uh, to manage the data pipeline. And we are expanding the, the flow, uh, the, the resource pool, but we haven't seen a big challenge for the resource management. Okay, cool. Next question is from Sekar. Mm -hmm. How do you manage dynamic task creation in Goku Flow? Yeah, a good question. And uh, so actually, uh, we are uh, we are developing a tool and uh, calling the Goku uh, Control. It's based on the REST API, but based on the Go uh, programming language. That's a good question. Actually, we use some property file, and the people can create a, 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 a programmatically because all the you can use a DSL and also this new tool. And you pro you can programmatically create a, a a a Goku flow and using the configuration file and running you know a dynamic. Uh, uh, configuration and also we have seen a lot of uh, teams or users and uh, they can promptly they for, for example they are using the r studio and they are using uh, some other tool and uh, to create a flow or trigger a flow on the fly got it and then do you this is another interesting one do you use any inbuilt or open source tools for data quality tests okay yeah and uh, currently uh we are using the Mainly, we are using the Delta Data Lake for the quality checks, and because we are the Google Flow, you can think about it, uh, we are not the uh, 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 purely ETL uh, tool, and but it definitely it can be used for the purely ETL or data ingestion. We are really like a grab for the people grab the data, and they can do some data aggregation, 
And so we leave this logic and uh, to the users. And if they have any, uh, for example, uh, uh, they want to do some data quality check, definitely they can use, when they build the data pipeline, they can embed some data quality checks. But we are trying to provide the database lake as some uh, facility and we can provide the tool and they can do some quality check. Got it. Last question. Does Goku Flow register data link? Yes. And so this is the reason we are, I'm mentioning, I repeat several times, and we really want to integrate the Goku Flow and the ML Flow and also Delta Data Lake. And definitely it will provide a single uh, uh, stop of a uh, uh, solution and the people can track or understand the data lineage and from the uh, single source of truth. And now it will, we have, what we have seen that People, if they want to track back, they just jump a different tool. They go to the ATFS and to understand what data look like. They go to the Goku flow, understand uh, what the running uh, execution type. And also they go to the some model part and look at the model things. So this reason, uh, if we, we integrate these three tools and provide a single interface and people get the full life cycle of the data. Yeah, it's a good question. Cool. Thank you, Lei. Really appreciate your talk. Super okay. insightful. All right. With that, we're going to conclude our time today. We want to thank three groups of people who uh, who made this happen. The first group of people is uh, is uh, are the speakers from from Lyft, Andre and John. Thank you for uh, coming and sharing your talk. Second is obviously Lei from Workday who shared his talk. And the third one is uh, Bill Yu, who you see him as AI Camp US. He's the person who hosted the the Zoom talk. Um, so thank you, Bill, for all your help. Uh, we are, one more time, SF Big Analytics Meetup. Um, my name is Mark Grover. I'm a product manager at Lyft. We have a lot of interesting uh, new virtual sessions coming up. So the next one is on July 28th on this hybrid transactional analytical processing. And the one after that is around machine learning visualization that's interactive, and that's on August 4th. Uh, we try to do these at uh, lunchtime. There are every two weeks on average, so we hope you can dial in and we will post the video momentarily. Thank you again for